Hello, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Williams, Director of City Planning and Development for Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you for taking time out to watch a recording of the Mobility Strategy Session 5, um, one of a series of meetings we're having to gain public feedback and insight on recommendations that will be in the city's forthcoming updated comprehensive plan. Um, so this session was held on December 16th, 2021, uh, and we did a few things to set up the conversation that you will be able to watch in its entirety um, after you finish watching this introduction. We went over housekeeping rules with folks and we always do that. Uh, we used a device called Mentimeter and that allowed the participants to be able to provide answers to poll questions, um, indicating whether they thought we were on track or not, or providing some more specific comments. And those people that were not able to do that uh, were able to provide comments in the chat during the call. Uh, we also asked people as they joined our meeting, ask them to indicate where they lived in the city. And the map you see on the screen basically were the three different regions we asked people to tell us where they lived, uh, north of the Missouri River, um, south of the Missouri River, but north of 63rd Street or Blue Ridge Cutoff, the central section city, and then anything south of 63rd Street and Blue Ridge Cutoff, we asked people to identify that they lived in the southern section city, lived or worked in one of those three regions of the city. We also always give people some guidance on how to use Zoom tools. And we just to use chat and raise your hands. And you'll see we use the chat feature a lot during the call, which was great. Uh, we provide people the access to Mentimeter. And if people haven't experienced that tool, it really is very helpful. Uh, but again, the focus of that was to get feedback, specific and individual feedback from participants about what they thought was on track and what they thought might be missing. The meeting provided an overview of some of the past mobility sessions, um, talked a lot about our comprehensive planning work and transportation elements within. Um, we then dug in a bit more and talked about recommendations and concepts um, as it relates to what the mobility network of the city should look like in the future. And then we always tell people uh, what the next steps are after the meeting um, that they're participating in, what, what they can help us do. So why do we have mobility, uh, any strategy session, but mobility in particular? We were looking to get information about the direction uh, for multimodal transportation opportunities in the city. Um, this is a comprehensive plan. So we're always looking to get the citywide view of things. Think macro, think bigger. Uh, and that's what we're looking to do with this whole comprehensive plan process. Um, these meetings are also the opportunity for people to uh, express um, issues regarding the topic, in this case, mobility, um, what they think are some shared values regarding mobility, and what some priorities would be from their perspective in terms of improvements the city should make regarding mobility or, or how we move around in the city. Um, these sessions also help identify any challenges or opportunities as it relates to implementing any of the recommendations in the plan. And besides challenge or opportunity, um, really providing some clear roadmaps, um, some clear path for getting change implemented. Ultimately, we want people to participate in these sessions because we're looking for each and every person that lives, works, provides a service in Kansas City. We want them to be a champion for the adopted plan. That'll make sure that we get as many of the recommendations implemented over the lifespan of the plan. So the KC Spirit Playbook. Uh, this is something we always give people a bit of insight on about what is it? It's the process under which we are leading, but the city is really undertaking to update the city's comprehensive plan. That plan sets uh, the priorities and goals regarding land development decisions across the entirety of the city. But in addition to talking about how the city develops um, and how it physically grows, it also provides very important guidance in other policy areas, um, housing, livability, and transportation, which is really um, mobility. Um, and so, this document provides comments and that's why this meeting is important and these goals are important. We need your feedback as we start putting together um, those guidance and those guiding documents and policies. Um, our current plan was adopted in 1997, so it's time to update it. And these plans are updated on a 20 year cycle. So um, as you look at this and review the tape and hopefully participate in future, put on your thinking caps about what Kansas City should look like and would be in its best form 20 years from now.
So building off the last session, the thing about having a recorded meeting is that you can go back and listen to the feedback that you got. So we worked in small groups that were again, oriented North Central South Kansas City. And as you all developed your personas, you started to tell the story of what the mobility experiences were like for the people that um, you envisioned to be in our future network. So we were able to listen to all of those stories and hear your answers to the questions and craft the personas that we're gonna share with you today. So if you were there before, you know that we basically use really um, open digital worksheets. And so copies of the ones that you all worked on are on the screen right now. On those sheets, we ask you to describe the people who were in this future mobility network. How old are they? What kind of job do they have? Um, what's some of their educational background? Again, what are their goals, attitudes, et cetera, about transportation? What do they look like? What's their name? So as I go through this, this is going to be the summary of what you all shared. So we had two Northern personas. This is the first one's persona A. And this happens to be a person named Katie and she has children. Katie's a single mom. She's in her late thirties. Everybody's active. She lives on the west side of the Northland but she works down in Riverside. Just imagine her journey. And she has a lot of things that she's got to get done. She's shuttling her kids. She's going to work. Um, she wants to be able to have other options for getting around. She's interested in park and ride options and so on. With each of these personas, you're going to see a couple of paragraphs that summarize the persona's story. And then you're also going to see some key improvements or recommendations that the groups thought would make this a good experience for this particular person or this family. And so for Katie and her kids, it was more awareness of public transit options. So what are the alternatives to just driving around in, your, in her car with her kids? How else can she get around? Also changing the mindset of just driving in a single person vehicle? Um, are there unique destinations that, can, that she can go to and so on? And again, as you see this, they're all set up the same. You'll see the persona, you'll see the worksheet that generated all of this. And keep in mind, some of these have a lot of notes on the left-hand side, some of them have fewer, but we listened to the recording of you all doing the report out, telling the story, and that's how we were able to flesh in some of the details and make the story. Here's another persona. This is a Northland persona as well. And this is a family, this is Galena and Navish's family. They've newly immigrated to the Northland. They have children. They want to be um, really in the culture. They have to go to school. You've got college students here. You've got a yoga teacher here. Um, they only have one vehicle. And they have to use that vehicle to do all the things that people have to do in life getting groceries, going to school. Um, they go to the Islamic Center, they're teaching classes, um, lots of different things. They wanna have choices. They're used to having choices um, in their previous home and they're used to being able to bike there as a choice, but that's not um, as available to them in the Northland. And so um, they're looking for things that'll make them feel comfortable. Some of their recommendations had to do with visual guides and maps. Sometimes since they're multi, um, at least bilingual, having materials that are easily translated and then having a way to bike safely. Those are some of the things that were important to this particular persona or family. The Murphy family is uh, one of our central personas. We have Marco and Alina Murphy. They're in their 60s. Um, they're discovering that they're just as busy in retirement as they were when they were working. They're really involved with their family things. They have grandchildren, they volunteer, they go to church, lots of different things are going on. They know that you know, their bills are starting to increase, particularly the bills related to their personal vehicles. They're a little bit concerned about using public transit, but they, they know it's important to start using other options. They have a long list of recommendations that they thought would make their experience better. So we've got fixing the sidewalks, the use of universal design principles, um, using their smartphones, coordinating with other modes of transportation. So you've got dial a ride and buses and streetcars. Again, transit options, wanting to feel safe. They want traveling to, tra to transportation options and destinations to be safe. And then they think that the, the needs that they have in addressing those will also be good for younger families. Here is a second persona for the central part of the city. This per persona's name is Jen. She's in her 40s. She um, has a child who has a child. So Jen's actually a grandma. She works in a management position at a local business. They 
their household has a single car and they're using that to um, find work for her daughter, to take their grandson, her grandson to school. She's concerned also about costs and her car is a used car. So she's wondering what the options are going to be with that if it breaks down. They're looking at public transportations, but they have some concerns about that. And some of the things that they think are gonna be important in terms of a recommendation or improvements have to do with um, the intensity, density and, uh, of destinations and trips, making those shorter and closer together. Again, they're interested in transit options that benefit their community. They're interested in lower costs for transportation as well. The last persona that we have is Jamie and his mom. Jamie's in his thirties. He has a doctorate degree. He's recently moved to Brookside for his job. Um, he has his mom who um, is in a wheelchair. She's got needs. He also has two children. He has an ex-partner that lives in the Northland. So that means Jamie is going from south of the river, somewhere in the, you know, south of 63rd Street up to the Northland. So he's all over the city. And that's part of his journey. And he's trying to think about you know, how to get around in a more environmentally sensitive way as he moves forward. Some of the recommendations that were interesting to him or that were important to him had to do with safe routes to school, being in a, having protected and accessible routes and having a neighborhood that was connected to the wider transportation network. So overall, what I would say is the personas that everyone developed were way more detailed, I think, than what we would have developed if we were staff. And that's why we're not the ones doing them. That's why we had people do people in the community develop the personas that they thought were going to be relevant and important to think about for their areas. And really what you come out with are people that have really complicated lives, lots going on in their lives, and they want to have options for getting around. I think one of the things that you'll notice is all of these personas use their cars, but they do have an interest in not only having the car is the only way that they get around. So as we think about recommendations, we also wanna keep these personas and these experiences in mind because even though they're fictitious, they are reflective of people that I'm sure that some of you have come across before in your life or maybe in your life, these types of people and their experiences. And so with that, I'm gonna give this to Bobby and talk, well, maybe I'm gonna keep on talking for a second. We need to hear from you all as we talk about recommendations what you're thinking about. We're gonna talk about what we've heard, also the data that we've got, and we wanna know from you what we're missing, what needs clarification, are we missing something in relationship to equity, and then uh, what are your thoughts on implementation? So one of the things that we wanted, we, we realized during our engagement that we really needed to make sure that everyone was on the same page with was the sort of analytical basis for the level of recommendations. So, you know, we took our, we took, we made our recommendations based on um, the recommended policies, at least, based on a lot of engagement. We looked back at old engagement or surrounding focus, um, area plan engagement, and then um, and other projects, as well as the engagement that we've been doing in this particular comprehensive planning effort. We also took a very detailed look at data, historic data, new data, um, and how that related to previous engagement, engagement efforts and previous goals that had been set. And what we sort of landed on were three themes associated with transportation going forward for this round of recommendations were safety, equity, and choice. Um, so, right, uh, can you go to the next slide real quick? I just wanna make sure that, so yeah, wh what we're gonna do right now is kick it over to Jay Aber and he's gonna discuss the, the data and the analysis behind what we've been, um, with the recommendations that we've been making and how those the that that analysis corresponds with that sort of tripartite um, uh, theme. Thanks, Bobby. Um, yeah, so uh, like like Bobby had mentioned, um, safety, equity, choice. Uh, these are things that are are really important. Um, and um, when we've talked about uh, transportation throughout these meetings, throughout the past planning efforts, the area plans, all the way back to focus. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about how do we achieve that safety, equity, and choice, 
and how can we, we do that moving forward? Uh, we're obviously at a, a point where we're updating a comprehensive plan. Uh, we're at that point where we can start to really make uh, substantial, substantial change uh, in moving towards uh, achieving our goals. And uh, one of those things is that over the past uh, really 70 years or so, uh, we've created a really uh, good system for moving cars, uh, for driving around the city. Kansas City uh, has uh, among the lowest uh, amount of congestion of all of our peer cities. That chart on the right shows uh, about 25 peer cities and we are on the very far right. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee is the only city with lower congestion than ours. Um, and the congestion that we have is really limited to highways and highway interchanges. Uh, that commute time is about 20 minutes, a little over 20 minutes. And much of the congestion we have in the city is related to in incidents, whether it's construction or crashes. Um, and we have very few congested city streets. And so uh, as we move forward talking about choice and equity, uh, we've made a system that works really well for driving. Uh, and that's great, that, that's uh, good for freight, that's good for economic development, uh, but it's not good necessarily for all our residents. We're talking about equity issues, people without access to, to automobiles, and then also the safety issues that come with it. So when we're talking about safety, um, Kansas City uh, ranks uh, among the highest uh, fatal traffic crashes uh, based on population of all of our peers. Again, on the right, that's a chart that shows a lot of our peer cities. And Kansas City is the red line there. That's 15 fatal car crashes per 100,000 residents uh, annually. Uh, St. Louis is a little bit higher than ours, uh, but in general, we're higher than our peer cities. Missouri is at 13.7 fatal car crashes per 100,000 residents, and then the United States average uh, in orange there is 10.3. So we're we're substantially above the U.S. average, above the Missouri average, uh, and really indicates that uh, we have uh, a lot of issues surrounding safety in the city uh, when in in relation to transportation uh, and car crashes that result in in deaths and severe injuries. This has uh, been a problem for a long time. This is, and, and of course, this is not uh, limited to Kansas City. Uh, the entire United States has uh, really a, a, an epidemic of fatal car crashes, and it, they have been increasing over time across the United States. It's no different in Kansas City. Uh, so we can see over the last 10 years, about 10 years, uh, there's been a 40% increase in fatal traffic crashes and 25% increase in, in serious injury traffic crashes. So uh, not only is it an, an issue, but it's, it's a growing issue uh, that really touches all of our lives. And something to, to keep in mind, which is really important, uh, there's the Vision Zero uh, Task Force in the city right now. The city passed the Vision Zero Resolution uh, earlier uh, this year. And um, Vision Zero has a lot of focus on vulnerable road users, pedestrians, and cyclists, but we also have to keep in mind that about 85% of our fatal and serious injury crashes don't involve pedestrians or cyclists. Uh, only about 15% involve pedestrians and cyclists. But when you look at the mode share uh, of how many people are actually walking and biking around the city, it's only about 2% 2, 2 of the trips are walking and biking. So those pedestrians or cyclists are really highly overrepresented in these fatal and serious injury car crashes, but most of them are still uh, involved drivers. So what this means, again, back to equity, we need to really focus on safety for everyone. Safety, whether you're driving, safety, whether you're walking, safety, whether you're biking, uh, whether you need to do those, whether you want to do those, that comes back to that choice. We want everybody in the city to have the ability to move around the city uh, in the mode they choose and do so safely. Uh, equity uh, is, is obviously a very important part of this comprehensive plan uh, and all of our discussions in the city right now. And when it comes to traffic safety and mobility, that's no different. Those maps on the right, you can see uh, the map on the left shows life expectancy. The map on the right shows fatal uh, car crash rates. And uh, the east side of the city, the side that's been historically segregated, historically disinvested, uh, that has uh, our, a large amount of our uh, minority communities uh, and also a large number of uh, low-income uh, residents and people living in poverty has uh, both a much lower uh, life expectancy and also a much higher uh, fatal car crash rate. Uh, so these safety issues and mobility issues uh, are, are, are intertwined with equity uh, and uh, addressing them will be important. And then one final uh, 
piece of uh, uh, information, we have talked a long time about increasing uh, a choice, increasing uh, the mode share of uh, walking, biking, and transit usage. But over the past 10 years, we actually have fewer people walking, fewer people biking, and fewer people using public transit. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Therese. So, you know, what we're talking about with this plan, again, back to that safety, equity, and choice. Um, we have opportunities in the, in the city where we can make changes, where we can improve safety, we can make uh, mobility, uh, improve equity through mobility and provide those choices throughout the city. Uh, and most importantly, uh, it's not a zero sum game. You know, we're not trying to pit different modes of transportation against each other. Uh, there are certainly ways we can um, have recommendations in this plan that can make uh, continue that easy driving through the city, also make it safer to drive, also make it safer to access transit, to walk and bike, uh, whether you need to or whether you have to. Um, and that's really the basis of the recommendations that we have uh, that we'll talk through and gauge your input on. So when talking about the recommendations, um, this is some of that summary um, from what Travis mentioned, what Bobby mentioned, what, what uh, Mr. Williams mentioned uh, throughout all this engagement. Um, these are some really high level things that we've uh, talked about. Transportation is very important to everyone in Kansas City, uh, whether that's businesses, freight companies, uh, residents, uh, visitors, it's important it touches all aspects of our lives. Improvements in transit, walking, biking are very popular. We've heard from you all. We've heard throughout the area plan process uh, throughout the last 20 years and from focus plan. These are very popular improvements. We also want to be able to travel safely by car. Um, there's no question about it. Driving is incredibly important. Uh, we need to maintain that. We need to make it safer to drive uh, and also walk and bike. And then equity and transportation investments is really important. And finally, delivering on promises. And before we get into the discussion where we gather a lot of feedback from you all, we do have um, some kind of more technical things. Just wanted to touch on these things. These aren't um, uh, elements that uh, are, um, are up to, uh, that we need a lot of feedback on because they are very more, much more technical things uh, and things that uh, are, are much more straightforward. Things like asset management, uh, making sure that we are being efficient with uh, the way funds are being uh, used throughout the city, whether it's fulfilling potholes, making sure those are targeted in, in very strategic ways, also leveraging existing and emerging technologies to make that uh, efficient, both traffic operations wise and from asset management, leveraging big data, and then also uh, paying attention to freight, uh, making sure freight can move efficiently through the city. It's a big economic driver in the city. Uh, and getting those freight recommendations. So we have uh, looking towards a freight routing plan uh, to make that freight movement easier. And Jay, before you, before the team moves forward, um, I just wanna thank everybody. We're, we're getting uh, great comments in the chat feature. Those also get captured. So we're able to go back and to make adjustments. Um, I think also know that um, we're at a place if you're seeing things that you don't see included, um, this is the very uh, reason we're looking forward to your common participation. Um, please indicate that and know that we're at a place where adjustments um, will continue to, to be made. So appreciate that. And if you have a concern about being something omitted, include that. If you have a direct recommendation, please include that as well. Um, so the idea is to share information with you. But again, as we set up the at the top, what things are we missing? What things do we need to clarify? Um, and then how do any of the recommendations presented, what's, what is their impact on a number of fronts and, and equity is one of those, um, sustainability, environmentally, fiscally, um, other types of comments. So please keep them coming. Um, we'll be able to provide response back in chat and some, if there are comments that are more of the, you've not included this item, we are certainly taking note um, and we will take a look at, at the potential for uh, their inclusion in the final, in the, in the, as we near a more and more specific recommendations. So it's also important to bear in mind that these aren't the only recommendations associated with mobility in the plan. There's going to be another one of these meetings and we're going to um, be getting feedback online as well associated with more recommendations. So this is a, a 
a growing topic. Um, it's just sort of the first round of, of uh, discussions about the particular recommendations. Um, I guess I can talk about this slide as well. So there's two ways to comment on these draft recommendations. The first is to participate in this meeting. As you know, Minty Meter, discussions in the chat, um, that kind of deal. The second is make sure that you're um, and watching the space at uh, playbook.kcmo.gov. Um, and we can, we're can. we also sending out updates about this as well and um, using social media and every method we can to try to make sure people are aware. Um, you can go and register your comments about the recommendations and there's gonna be more recommendations to come that are put up there. But largely, you know, we've got these four questions that we're trying to sort of keep the parameters on the discussion, right? So what's missing? What needs clarity? What are the equ equity concerns? And what are suggestions for implementation? Um, and so with that, um, we're gonna go to the speed and safety and Jay's gonna keep rolling with that. Awesome, thanks Bobby. Yeah, and thanks Mr. Williams, that's a, a great input. Uh, absolutely wanna see all that chat activity and then on the Mentimeter as well. So we have three primary topics uh, this session that we wanna cover that we really want some far targeted feedback from you all. And the first is speed and safety. Then we move on to transit, bike and pedestrian. And then another, uh, the third category related to transparency and implementation. So <clears throat> the three primary recommendations we have under speed and safety are to reduce vehicle speeds in the city. This is something we've heard a lot, something I see in the chat as well here, uh, fast moving cars through neighborhoods, uh, making it feel dangerous for pedestrians. Uh, and we know speed is a major contributing factor to whether a traffic crash is an injury, a serious injury or a fatal crash. Uh, so looking at that, there's a few uh, of those uh, action steps there, lowering the statutory speed limit uh, throughout the city to 20 miles per hour, setting speed limits based on goals versus the prevailing speed. Uh, historically, uh, engineering studies have looked at how fast drivers are driving to set the speed, uh, as opposed to uh, determining what a safe speed is on that road and setting the speed accordingly, and then looking at the use of automated speed enforcement. The second element there of speed and safety is lowering the barrier for traffic calming implementation. Uh, there's been a lot of traffic calming implementations throughout the city already. Uh, you can, many of you have, have likely seen them in your neighborhood, uh, but we lack a, a very simple and straightforward decision-making guide for how, when, and where uh, traffic calming is implemented. So uh, coming up with a more uh, a policy on traffic calming uh, that makes it easier to make those decisions and then also providing dedicating, dedicated funding uh, for those implementations. In the past, a lot of those implementations have paid, been paid through the uh, PIAC fund process. Uh, so this would be a more formal uh, implementation of that program. And third is developing and adopting a Vision Zero action plan. Uh, we do have, as I mentioned, the city council passed the Vision Zero resolution. There is a Vision Zero task force, but a Vision Zero action plan would go further than what we've done to date in terms of identifying uh, specific projects, identifying uh, action items, identifying champions for those projects, uh, uh, and different policy elements. So I have a few slides here just kind of going through some of these things uh, in a little bit more detail, and then we'll have uh, some opportunity for feedback. And again, keep that, uh, keep that dialogue in the chat going as well. Um, so lowering statutory speed limit on residential streets, as I mentioned, um, Looking at different speeds tw at 20 miles per hour, uh, only one in 10 pedestrians would would be killed being hit at that speed on average. 30 miles per hour that goes all the way up to five out of 10 pedestrians uh, would be killed hit at 30 miles per hour. And you go up to 40 miles per hour, uh, nine out of 10 pedestrians hit at 40 miles per hour will uh, be killed in a car crash like that. So speed has uh, a really important uh, function of safety uh, and lowering residential speed limits at 20 miles per hour could help mitigate some of those safety concerns. And I guess I should, Therese, maybe go back. Um, uh, statutory speed, um, I should mention that uh, statu because it's kind of a technical term, statutory speed is the speed that uh, drivers are legally required to drive throughout the city when a speed limit is not posted. So any speed, any street throughout the city doesn't have a posted speed limit on it. Uh, the statutory speed limit is at 20 miles per hour. 
Um, so, and I see some comments about enforcement that that wouldn't be enforced. Uh, and again, that's that's kind of that second piece and what we'll talk about in a minute with the automated speed enforcement. Uh, or right now, uh, or yeah, so speed limits, again, based on goals versus prevailing speeds. Um, there's different tools um, uh, put out by the Federal Highway Administration in terms of how you set, you can set speed limits based on uh, the neighborhood context, the safety aspects and other features, uh, and really get back to the goals of the community and the goals of that roadway in a very context sensitive uh, manner, uh, and what's a safe speed for that for that roadway. And then um, thinking about automated speed enforcement, uh, many of you I'm sure have seen uh, the cameras where you drive by them and it says uh, speed limit is 30 miles per hour and your speed is 38 miles per hour and it's flashing lights at you and saying basically slow down. Well, the next step uh, for those is actually using that for automated speed enforcement. So if you drove by, could be either a fixed location or a mobile location uh, and you drive by and you're going well above the speed limit, you'll automatically be uh, given a, a ticket. It's a, a very effective way to enforce speed limits. Uh, it's a very effective way uh, to get people to slow down. And um, I think there's a lot of consternation in the past about red light running cameras, which actually have uh, a, a not the best safety track record uh, as opposed to that automated speed enforcement cameras uh, have a lot of research uh, into their um, uh, being a, a very effective safety measure. So then again, traffic calming, uh, making that simpler to implement. Uh, right now we need to do pretty costly uh, traffic studies to get those implemented. A lot of times those traffic studies are paid for by uh, through PIAC funding, through council funds. Uh, and then um, beyond that, once the traffic study is done, which could take six months or a year, uh, then we can implement the traffic calming. And in some cases, the traffic studies will actually cost more than the traffic calming itself. Um, so looking at uh, creating a more simple decision guide so that we don't need to wait uh, as long, we can make it uh, uh, a more equitable in implementation of traffic calming across the city and providing those dedicated funds for that. And then the last element here, adopting Vision Zero Action Plan. Vision Zero is essentially a different way to think about traffic safety. In the past, we have thought that traffic deaths were inevitable, uh, that we needed to uh, perfect human behavior through enforcement and through education, uh, that uh, we need to look at all crashes and the individual responsibility is the most important thing. But with Vision Zero, we recognize that deaths are preventable on roadways. There are parts of the world that have effectively achieved Vision Zero and have no fatal car crashes. Um, we need to understand that humans are fallible. We will make mistakes um, and that we need to uh, create safe systems uh, so every part of the system is strengthened to improve safety, even when somebody makes a mistake, it doesn't result in them or someone else uh, losing their lives. Uh, and also understanding that saving lives is not expensive. As long as you are incorporating Vision Zero into all your um, decision-making processes, prioritizing investments. Okay, so if you're using your, if you're in Mentimeter, or maybe Becca will put the link in the chat and if that's easier for you. This is the first opportunity for commenting specifically about speed and safety that's maybe different than what you've been putting in the chat. We wanna know what our recommendations for speed and safety if we are on the right track. You can do yes, no, maybe, or if you're unsure, let us know that. And then we're gonna have a follow-up question that asks what we're missing from that. And while you are voting, I know there's about 30 of you. I can see five of you have voted, so I'll give you some time to do that. Jay, in the chat, there's a question about the speed limit and if we're talking about 20 miles an hour on every residential street. So the statutory speed limit recommendation would be for, again, those unsigned streets. So that would not be every street in the city by any means. Streets, uh, especially collector streets or major streets, uh, may, based on their context, want to have speed limits that are higher than 20, uh, 35, 30, 35. Um, those would be signed that way. And most of those major streets are already signed that way today. So any street that has a speed limit sign, uh, the speed limit is legally what the sign says and not what the statutory speed limit said. So that would be 
the statutory speed limit would mostly be rec uh, for residential neighborhoods, residential local streets, uh, really the street that you live on uh, in your house would be um, a street that would have that speed limit. And Jay, I'm sorry, I think that the part B that too is it, would we be looking at any modification of the city's major street plan or the street classifications? And uh, no, that's, that is not um, what is being contemplated. Yep, that's absolutely right, Mr. Williams. The major street plan is a separate um, legal document that controls those things and any change of that would require uh, specific ordinances for the city council. Um, so that may be something to consider. We have a later on talking about transparency implementation recommendations for further planning, transportation planning, uh, and any changes to major street plans, different uh, designations on there or changes to how the major street plans implemented would definitely be uh, beyond uh, the scope of, of this comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. So about 15 people, well, 15 people have voted so far. That's about half the people that are here. I know some of them are staff. So if you're needing to vote, please do. There was a question in the chat about the question, which is, are we on the right track? Are we talking about right now or with the current ideas? We're talking about with the recommendations that we've been, excuse me, that we've presented based on everything that we've heard and the data that we've gathered and the conclusions drawn from it. Are we on the right track with the recommendations that we've just outlined? So we're hitting that almost two thirds of you have voted, 19 people. If you're still mulling this over, go ahead. I'm gonna to move to the next question though. You'll see a blue button at the top of your screen if you're using your phone and it'll say, um, go to the next question. So here's our next question, what's missing? Please think about you know, some of the questions, the comments that you see in the chat, also the people that you know that are using our mobility network right now and the ones that are going to be using it in the future. Are we missing anything that would make their experience better, for example? Is there a recommendation that we haven't come up with yet? And you can type that through Mentimeter. If it's easier for you, you could raise your hand and then we can unmute you and you could talk it out and we will take notes on that and pop that onto the Mentimeter. You could also use the chat and we'll grab it and pop it onto Mentimeter. So, so far we've got something missing is statutory changes or appointments. We need to work on road design to slow traffic. And I know y'all are working because I don't see anything in the chat happening either, but I, things are slowly popping on screen. So legal, regu excuse me, legal regulations are on automated systems have not been considered, okay. And I can I speak to that, that automated speed enforcement is legal in Missouri. Uh, there are some implementations of it, so that would not be uh, a legal barrier. There are certainly states uh, and locations where automated speed enforcement is still illegal. Um, but uh, as the data comes out for the safety track record for it, um, it is becoming more and more common across the United States, but it is legal in, in Missouri to have automated speed enforcement. I also see a comment on screen about public personal safety. Even if we reach vision zero, people won't use public transit if they don't feel safe active transit at transit stops. Reality, no enforcement. Current policy is opposite of what safety requires. Comment about that. All neighborhoods ask for traffic calming at some point. We just need to fund these requests and give neighborhoods a toolbox to choose from. So a recommendation for a toolbox there. Specific goals for increasing the amounts of transit, walking, biking, and for decreasing driving. I think that comment builds on our sort of um, this is what we hope to achieve and this is how mode shift hasn't changed. We've gotten data on that and you're asking for some specifics going forward. Do we have good information on the cause of fatalities? Are they caused by speeding on side streets? Jay, can you elaborate on that a bit? Um, so the vast majority of fatal crashes in the city are on the major streets. Um, they're on the streets with higher speed limits. Um, and as we showed earlier, they are highly concentrated in areas with lower income and high minority percentages of population. 
Um, so um, we are in the process of creating a, a high injury network map that will show those high injury streets. Uh, but uh, initial looks at where all the fatal crashes are happening, they are primarily happening on four lane uh, streets and larger, so four lane, five lane, six lane streets uh, and those higher speed streets. They're not uh, very common in neighborhood, uh, on local streets, on residential streets. Thanks, Jim. And I can say, uh, I just want to mention too, Brad mentioned that the red light cameras were illegal uh, by the Missouri Supreme Court. Um, that That is, uh, I'm not sure about red light cameras, that may be accurate, but uh, the point with this is that these are dramatically different from red light cameras. These are not the same thing as red light cameras. Um, so they don't uh, operate under the same uh, legal framework. Um, so uh, I appreciate the input, Brad. Uh, red light cameras, as I mentioned, do not have a very good safety record, uh, whereas automated speed enforcement does, and it's a, a different legal framework that would uh, actually uh, control those. So that's separate, a separate issue from the red light camera and, and the Missouri Supreme Court. There's some more comments on here about focusing on design and not the law. You always have people breaking the laws, but um, if you design in a smart way, you can eliminate most of the need and desire to break that. Yeah, and that's sort of the point of the whole Vision mm -hmm. Zero framework is that it, you know, they, they talk about the five E's of transportation and, you know, enforcement, education, um, engineering, um, and, and that one specifically focuses on engineering. So it's you kind of engineer the roads to factor in human error so that it makes the roads safer by design and um, doesn't give you the sort of visual cues and the amount of space necessary to be able to, 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 to drive on safely. Um, it's, and it's all about sort of reducing speed as well. There's other comments on here about the emphasis is needed on strong traffic regulation and enforcement. You can calm traffic right out of the city. It needs to move on thoroughfares and stay out of neighborhoods. And there were comments in the chat about speeding cars going through neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, I've got, I, I gotta say from my own personal experience, cut through traffic is an absolute nightmare in my neighborhood. And, um, essentially like looking at, you know, looking at um, the most efficient way to move cars throughout the, throughout the, the system is, you know, that that's something that's constantly being reimagined, but um, the, uh, the, the issue of cut through traffic, I guess, is, is something that, that absolutely needs to be addressed and will, um, We'll think about that for sure and, and factor that into the next round of recommendations because there's that's been mentioned a lot. There are lots of great comments on here. I'm, so, I'm sharing my screen with you all, so I'm sort of scrolling down through them, but also for time, I'm going to move to the next topic. If you are still commenting, you can. Um, if you're in Mentimeter, you can still pop things onto the screen. I'm going to go to the next slide, though, and you can catch me by hitting the blue button when you're ready. Okay, so um, again, my name is Bobby Evans. I'm with the Long Range Planning Department, and this set of recommendations about transit, um, biking, and um, and pedestrian. So uh, we're calling it transit, bike, and ped. All the way back in focus in 1997, there's been recommendations in this city associated with um, making it safer and easier to get around on foot, get around by the bus, and get, and get around by uh, by riding a bicycle. Um, those recommendations follow through to all 18 area plans, which are all built on a strong foundation of engagement. We hear this all the time that people want to have the choice to be able to get around, not just by the vehicle. Um, this doesn't just happen to be with the commute, but being able to go to the store or visit a friend or go out to dinner or go to a movie just to be able to not have to get in the car to do literally everything. So that's the sort of mindset that we're coming through with this is that you know there's enough room on the roads because we just don't have that much congestion and so we can we can do what we can from a design perspective to make it safer to get around um and these things aren't necessarily just a, a zero-sum game and i hope that, that folks understand that so the first recommendation is to be able to um, improve mobility access and safety of transit walking and biking that's sort of the general recommendation and so um, a part of that is to develop a complete streets design manual. So we heard um, uh, comments in the Mentimeter, and I think that probably came from Vicki Notice because I can recognize her 
um, eloquent writing about a, a toolkit for neighborhoods to be able to, to talk about traffic calming. So that's the kind of thing that would, that would produce something like that. The second one is establish and monitor goals for transit, walking, and biking. We've, we've said we want to make it easier, but the way that that shows up is that people actually choosing that as their mode, taking, make, taking those trips. And over time, that has, we haven't seen much of a change. And so, you know, we want to be able to more regularly revisit those goals and understand how people are getting around and be able to, to count what you care about. Um, and the third one is to uh, designate pedestrian priority zones and network of streets. So just understanding that there's some places that, um, you know, that should be more pedestrian oriented than not. Um, some places, uh, you know, especially like neighborhoods and maybe some shopping districts and things like that, where the, the pedestrian is sort of the, the highest user in that area. The next one is um, improve transit. Sorry. Oh, sorry, go back one more. Improve transit service and supportive infrastructure and development. So that's like being able to set a bunch of policies that will help make transit a better option for more people and a safer option for more people. I have been moving, living back in Kansas City for uh, just over two years now. And I, one of the biggest surprises for me is how popular transit is here. Anytime you have an engagement um, discussion, people love transit. They, they, they want to see more of it. And, you know, capitalizing, uh, capitalizing on that, I think is, is um, we, we need to do it. So, um, the first one is, we, we heard this particular issue quite a bit, and so we put it in our recommendations, which is dedicate sufficient funding and fully implement the Smart Moves plan. Um, so that came up a bunch, and um, you know, Smart Moves affects Kansas City, Missouri, and so we, we made that as one of our recommendations. The next one is um, require TOD, which is transit-oriented development, implementation along all BRT, which is bus rapid transit and streetcar lines. Sorry for the, so many acronyms. We only have so much space on the page. So this is essentially the land use regulations near max lines and streetcar lines should change such that it would make it supportive of that form of transportation. So we already have a TOD overlay on Main Street, which um, has uh, worked you know, the, the, it, it's, it's still functioning. We're currently um, exploring um, some land use changes along Prospect to help support the Prospect Max. This recommendation is basically just saying, make that a, a common thing around every Max or BRT and streetcar line that we do these, because we, we have a TOD policy. Enact that TOD policy everywhere that we have um, BRT and streetcar. Next one is, um, <clears throat> develop station area plans with first mile, last mile, walking and biking infrastructure at all of those bus rapid transit and streetcar stops. So in order to make transit a better and easier option, the issue is getting to transit. And one of the ways that's the, one of the easiest ways that you see great success in other places is to be able to work on that first mile, last mile. So that's the first mile before you get to the transit stop and the last mile after you get off the transit stop. How are you going to get around? Well, it's typically not going to be in a car. So we need to make it easier and safer and more convenient for people to be able to get to and from transit. And that's probably going to happen through some sort of pedestrian activity bicycling or micro mobility. And so this is um, this recommendation is associated with um, making transportation uh, considerations a part of the station area plans around um, the, the stations and for those uh, transit lines. Um, sorry, I'm going to cast my gaze on the chat to make sure. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so yeah, uh, if we don't, okay, there's a there's a bunch going on. First off, I'm seeing one that says it's incongruous to equate bike transportation with pedestrian safety, transit needs, and vehicle safety. Paying for bike lanes where neighborhoods have no sidewalk curbing gutter is crazy. The number of users for autos, transit, and pedestrians should move those improvements up above bike spending just due to numbers alone. These things are not equitable. Um, so I guess, you know, we have put a bunch of money toward sidewalks and um, the, 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 the go bond is, is proof of that. Um, specifically a bike plan in particular is, is sounds like it's in the works right now. If you're following the city council, but 
in particular, I don't know if we're seeing any sort of zero sum game associated with bike funding. And that's not one of the recommendations that we're particularly making by no stretch of the imagination. But we are talking about um, making it safer for people to get around by bike where that works. So, you know, creating a, a, a network, but that's not, you know, going to be at the expense of transit. That would not be at the expense of of pedestrian activity and in fact a lot of times you know those things do work hand in hand um where it is safer to bike it's also safer to be a pedestrian and it's also safer to to ride a scooter and it's also safer to be a transit user because transit users are inherently pedestrians when they get on and off the bus so um that's the way that we're thinking about this when we're putting for these recommendations can we go to the next slide so this complete streets design manual, it's actually called for in the complete streets ordinance, but we just really wanted to reinforce it in this recommendation. Can go to the next slide. Sorry. Oh, yeah. And that the sorry, I'm sorry. The complete streets um, design manual would typically what you see in other cities is they would set out a, um, a set of typologies of, of different types of streets. So you see really good ones in Los Angeles and, and Philadelphia. And there's actually like a national model for this. But what they do is they set out about like you know, it's very context specific to your city and you see great examples, but they set up like 15 to 20 different sort of types of streets and there's a ton of engagement around this. It's very design oriented. And so when improvements are made on streets, they, they need to sort of follow that design guideline. Um, yeah, okay. So establishing and monitoring goals for walking, biking and transit, that's, you know, mode share. We, we, we know people are using it when people are using it. And we know it's it's useful, safe and, and fun and easy to get around when people are actually using those modes. And so if we have you know targets associated with that, then we'll be able to see if what we're doing is actually um, adhering to community priorities. So when done well, um, pedestrian friendly and pedestrian only zones work really well. They can become incredible places um, of, you know, commerce and interaction and um, human to human contact and just, just create the fabric of the city. You see this all over the place. Um, this idea is had came, came up in a bunch of our engagement. And so we wanted to make a recommendation associated with it. This isn't by any means calling out, let's do it here, let's do it there, but sort of reinforcing the idea that people that there is a community desire for this. There is a community desire for a place where people can sort of relax and not have to and as pedestrians and um, you know um, and get around by foot. And then the TOD uh, implementation issue is sort of expanding on an existing policy. Um, this came up a lot because the links between land use and transportation are so great and they feed off of one another. Um, and um, as we move forward with the larger and larger investments in transit in terms of trying to grow our transit system, um, making sure that our land use policies are ones that, uh, that support further expansion and, um, and use of the transit system. Okay, so this one is um, basically increasing the amount of funding for a high frequency connected reliable transit system seven days a week. Um, you know, this actually probably was the most popular recommendation <laughs> that we've gotten. I, I don't think I've ever done an engagement event where, you know, people haven't said we need to fund more transit. So just like looking at how much we can possibly contribute to the, and I know we do contribute quite a bit to the transit system, but, you know, investing even more because we just keep hearing what a priority is for the community. And so that first, la first mile, last mile issue, right? Um, how do you get to the bus? How do you get from the bus, from your starting point to your, to your, the end of your destination needs to be safe. And, you know, that might be the sort of central spine for the way that we build out our, our, our biking, walking, and micro mobility infrastructure is associated with transit, right? So just to make sure that it is easy and safe and convenient for everyone to be able to access this transit system that they, you know, we hear so much about how everyone loves. Um, and um, we've, you know, we're, we got really big investments in streetcar coming up and um, 
and you know we're more and more planning and and um, construction around around transit. So let's make it um, let's support it every way we can, and and making sure that people can get to those lines is is really important. And so this is the one that kind of got left off the last slide, but you know Kansas City is such a region. If you look at like the where people live and where people work regionally in Kansas City, we have an equal number of people who leave Kansas City, Missouri to go to work as we have people who live outside of Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri and come into work. So regional cooperation is huge and we're recognizing that. And you know, a recommendation here is to work with um, our neighboring cities to, to be able to um, start to try to tackle some of those, um, some of the issues associated with with regional travel, and you know, we heard a ton about you know, let's let's do let's talk about commuter rail, let's let's take it seriously, and the options there associated with getting people around the region um, by a means other than the car, because like Jay said, you know, the traffic congestion in Kansas City is actually mostly concentrated on our highway system. Um, driving around Kansas City, Missouri, local streets, the, the the congestion when it's not associated with construction or incidents is fine. However, when you get on the highways, it's a different story, but that matters to a lot of people because, uh, you know, like I said, that many people travel in and out of the city and around the region in order to get to work. And we need to have a, we need to sort of renew these conversations about what we can do to uh, improve um, our regional mobility options. How can we get people around? Because if anything, that's gonna, you know, take, some pressure off of the roadway system. And um, it's been a, a very popular topic. And so it wound up as one of our recommendations. Um, seen a lot of, uh, seen a lot of discussion around here, but I think we might actually move on to just the Mentimeter portion. So the transit bike and pedestrian recommendations, are we on the right track, right? So I want to remind you, um, that none of these things are seen as, you know, going at the expense of the other. It is about creating more choices for people, creating more balance in our transportation system, um, not trying to make or eliminate any particular mode or favor any particular mode over any other one, but giving people more choices. And those choices are also something that you can see in the personas when you all were talking to us about who you see using this system in the future, that those choices are available to them. When we were talking earlier about transit-oriented development, more compact development, et cetera, even in the personas, there were comments about having destinations closer to one another and compact development TOD helps you do that. So we really wanna know, are we on the right track with the recommendations that we've presented? So y'all are voting a little bit faster on this one. So there are 11 of you that have voted so far. But keep on voting. There's about 30 of you in the space right now. I know some of your staff, so keep voting. Check in the chat and see if there's anything new in there. There's a question there um, from Vicki. What would be the criteria for pedestrian only streets? Bobby or Jay, can you answer that? I mean, that would have to play out, I guess, yeah. in the planning process, but. Um, yeah, I just, sorry, I just, <clears throat> well, I was just gonna say, I mean, I put that in the chat just now um, that um, similar to some of the other questions, specifics of where side, and we've seen uh, in the chat here as well, um, issues specifically surrounding areas without sidewalks, areas with crumbling sidewalks. So, you know, far beyond just thinking about pedestrian priority areas or pedestrian only areas as the whole conversation around sidewalks, uh, ADA ramps, um, sidewalk uh, maintenance, and then those other pedestrian areas. But all those things, those specific decisions on where sidewalks would pr be prioritized, uh, where pedestrian only mo zones could be, uh, would be a further planning uh, activity and not part uh, of the comprehensive plan process because this is more visioning goals, action items, and not the specifics of where projects uh, could happen. Okay. There's some more in the chat. Yeah, about, so there's oh, a, a clear strategy about all choices being available everywhere, mm -hmm. regardless of land use or history. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the way that these recommendations are formulated. These recommendations are formulated to sort of bolster that process of figuring out what works where and how to get folks there. Um, you know, in particular, you know, I would say that potentially with um, 
like an expansion of, of pedestrian infrastructure and making sure it's safe to walk anywhere in the city, you're, fire, you're hardly going to find anyone who disagrees with that. However, well, with, with other modes associated gonna, with transit and potentially... Is, I'm going to add a little bit more. I, oh. I, I'm looking at the comment. I, I think it's the idea that I think it take a recommended... Hey, I think that there's a greater likelihood of us being able to see as a city things get implemented if we're clearer about where we can take those opportunities to look at where certain choices are are best applicable. Um, I, I think that's just the, the feedback there is the idea that being specific where we can be um, is helpful. Um, and I think we're given room to set the context about where things possibly work better than, than others um, was the feedback I, I took on it. Oh, yeah. And then further, I mean, you know, there's like in particular, if you look at the um, if, the, if you look at the existing um, complete streets ordinance, for example, it follows the pattern of every other complete streets ordinance in the city. It says essentially that um, infrastructure for bicycles and scooters and micro transit that, that doesn't belong everywhere. Right. You need a network associated with those things that makes sense. And there needs to be a dense enough grid so that it's useful. But it's not just like slapping it on every single street that, you that, you know, it, mm -hmm. indiscriminately in any way, there's there's a, a, a network associated with those things. And that pairs well with Eric's comment in the chat, which is that we should prioritize things based on the outcomes we want. And that's sort of one of the sort of or overarching themes associated with this sort of section of the recommendations is letting community priorities that we've been getting through engagement, let, let those sort of set the stage for how we move forward with, you know, putting investments in various modes. Mm -hmm. So here's our next question, which is what's missing. So if you were looking at the slide before, it's like um, we're in the yes, no, halfway the same kind of comment. So there were like eight that said, yes, we're on the right track and six that said we were not. So that's almost, it's a similar number. So when you're responding to this question, please let us know what is missing. If there's something needs to be clarified, um, if we you want to see more about prioritization, if you need more detail, et cetera, please indicate that in your response. And then I see Marcus in the chat is saying, think of the equity versus equal image. We don't need equal, not all standing on the same box to look over the fence. We have different heights. Look each unto their needs by quarter, unit, et cetera. And then on the, in the Mentimeter, we're talking about gets to prioritization, detail and equity of need. And I've got your comment in the chat more specificity about what modes are appropriate in different parts of the city. And anti-car anti propaganda is on there. Next thing is balance across modes based upon real usage. A good comment. Let's see what else. Okay, we have a lot of bridges, but many of them feel unsafe or are actively hostile to pedestrians. Would love pedestrian bike only bridges. All aspects of complete streets should be funded when implemented. Gillum bike lanes rely on neighborhoods to find funding to complete proper signage and traffic routing. That's the latest comment from Mintimeter. And then there's one about the enormous need for sidewalk improvement, vast gaps between city perception and neighborhood reality. Again, you can Use Mentimeter, you can use the Zoom chat and we'll put it on Mentimeter. If you need to talk it out, raise your hand. We'll unmute you so you can share your thoughts and then we'll take notes and put those into the Mentimeter. Next comment we have is connecting, connecting up all the desperate trails and tracks into a usable whole. 
that's back to a network idea. And then tired of this sidewalk versus bike lane war, cars are the biggest issue. Let's see what else is in there. Getting some thumbs up in the chat from Brad about the trails. Laura's shocked about how many bus stops are on, excuse me, are on the side of a road with no shelter, no pad, even stand away from the street. So it looks like we need some better transit improvements or better transit projects. Okay, because of time, and it's 4.41, you all, we have one more section to go through, we have to present that, and then we need to give you some time to comment on it. So I'm gonna go to the next thing. Jay, when I get there, do you wanna take it away? Yes, I will. Thank you, Travis. Um, so this next part is about transparency implementation. Uh, we've heard from a lot of you all and throughout the process that um, we want, uh, in, even in this session in the chat, we want, um, uh, more immediate implementation of plans. Uh, we want plans to be implemented, the planning processes we're doing. Uh, we want things prioritized. We want things uh, located uh, where the greatest needs are. And so uh, that's this discussion on transparency implementation. And the first uh, major recommendation is to develop the citywide transportation action plan. Uh, this gets back to some of the comments in the chat about um, identifying uh, exactly where are these recommendations, whether they're the, the sidewalk improvements, the transit improvements, uh, improvements for driving, safety improvements, how all those get incorporated into uh, uh, a cohesive plan uh, where we have uh, identified key performance indicators so we know uh, what our goals are, what we're trying to achieve. We're uh, improving the oversight and transparency and project selection. Uh, so we're prioritizing projects, we're selecting projects in a transparent way with public involvement, and then those projects are moving forward through uh, the capital improvement plan process, through the council process, uh, all the way to implementation in a very transparent way, and then incorporating uh, existing plans or updating existing plans we have like the walkability plan the bike plan the trails kc plan the major street plan uh, into the citywide transportation action plan so this is really we have a very comprehensive look at the specifics of uh, where the needs are and um, where we want to prioritize and where we what which goals we want to achieve in terms of the performance indicators whether they're safety equity uh, transit usage other things the second is to dedicate transportation funding according to the city goals and areas of need so we can address equity and safety issues. So uh, this gets back to uh, project prioritization. So creating a comprehensive uh, prioritization metric that takes into fac factors such as equity, safety, and mobility so that when we're looking at which projects should we construct next year, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, uh, that we have a framework uh, for identifying those areas of need uh, related to equity, related to safety, related to mobility, uh, and getting those improvements built, uh, funded and built in the places that have the greatest need. And then setting up those goals uh, for transit access, levels of service, uh, pedestrian safety, uh, that network idea, bicycle network, again, not just putting bike lanes on every street, but looking at those network, uh, those network factors uh, and those goals. And then the final element here, uh, parking is always a, a big uh, topic of discussion in the city. Parking is very important for businesses, uh, but we have also discussions about too much parking, how much parking is needed. Uh, and so changing the idea of using parking minimums that require developers and require developments to build a certain number of parking stalls in a, in a development uh, and changing that idea to parking maximums. Uh, so we don't end up with uh, more parking than the community feels is appropriate for that type of development. So the next few slides just show a little bit of this, uh, the citywide action plan, looking at other peer cities, uh, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, Denver, are three we looked towards for what they're doing. Uh, all three of them have these citywide transportation action plans that have prioritization uh, metrics, prioritized project lists, 
Uh, so again, getting down to a, a comprehensive policy uh, and not looking at more of a, an ad hoc policy, but so that we can prioritize in areas of need. Uh, those key performance indicators are very important, uh, looking at specifically what is most important to our city. Um, is it safety? Is it how many people are walking? Is it how many people have access to jobs from transportation or to afford affordable housing uh, from transit lines? Uh, and look, identifying those key performance indicators and tracking those year to year uh, of how we're doing. Um, Improving the oversight uh, and transparency, creating more public accountability. This is something we hear a lot. Well, I'm paying taxes uh, and I don't see anything happening in my neighborhood specifically. Uh, and it's sometimes hard with a city as big as Kansas City uh, and as diverse as Kansas City to know exactly where uh, all the money is being spent, where, where your tax dollars are being spent. Uh, so creating that structure so uh, every citizen knows where their tax dollars are being spent, where the projects are, and how those projects tie back to the plans that you all have been involved with, the goals of the city and those key performance indicators. Uh, again, looking at those plans, we have a lot of plans in the city. Uh, many of them are relatively old. Our walkability plan is almost 20 years old. The major streets plan now uh, is 10 years old. Uh, and the bike KC master plan, which has not yet been adopted. And again, I think Bobby mentioned there's some movement on city council of uh, how that plan moves forward. But looking at specifically up updating these plans um, and incorporating them into that action plan. Uh, another thing, again, that transparency element uh, of really moving through this process of planning, uh, going from the plans to design and from the design to construction uh, in a very uh, straightforward, transparent way so that uh, we know the public engagement we've done uh, goes straight through to, to planning and design. And incorporating all that into this capital improvements plan, uh, the capital projects list. Uh, Kansas City currently has a capital improvements plan, a five-year plan, but only the, the first year is committed funding. Um, so looking at committing those funds a little further out in the future. And again, the parking, uh, parking maximums is an idea. We did present this to the Empowerment Committee. There's a lot of discussion on this, that maybe parking maximums are too extreme. Maybe we need to look at uh, instead of parking maximums, changing parking requirements based on target, based on uh, city context. And I think Bobby is raising yeah, his hand. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is um, the, it, we had a really good discussion about this in the Empowerment Committee and kind of looked into it a little bit more. And it's actually really common for our peer cities to create their own um, parking guidance. So right now, a lot of folks use the this, it's called the ITE manual, International Traffic Engineering Manual. And um, it's just not very contextual um, from both a time and geography sense. So you'll get like parking coefficients for a new um, development that are based upon developments in particularly like Phoenix in 1988 or something. And so it's like, this is Kansas City in 2022. We need something that, that makes more sense for us right now. And, um, you know, so while this does say maximums, this represents sort of a larger uh, discussion about how to, to change the way that we, um, that we in, you know, talk about building new parking. And with that, we have our mentee slides up again. So asking you all with these transparency implementation recommendations, are we on the right track with these recommendations? Are we not? Uh, are we maybe, are you unsure? And then we'll go on to ask uh, what's missing uh, and what are you interested in seeing more about? And while that's going on, there was a question in the chat, I think from Beth, if we have parking maximums, are we getting rid of the minimums? Um, traditionally, what's been done is that the parking minimums were set based on kind of the worst case scenario, according to uh, the Institute for Transportation Engineers has developed a parking generation manual, uh, which did a lot of studies and basically looked at for any given type of development, what's the maximum amount of parking would ever be needed in that development. So, um, you know, uh, two days before Christmas shopping for retail areas, things like that, what is the absolute maximum that would be needed? But instead of actually I, indicating that as the maximum parking in most places, uh, Kansas City included, those were incorporated as the minimum amount of parking. Um, so in many places, what they've done is simply swap minimum parking 
parking requirements to maximum parking requirements. So if um, a maximum parking requirement were implemented, most likely there would be no minimum, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. Uh, there are a lot of ways that could be done. There could be both a minimum and a maximum. So a range of parking that could be done. Uh, there could be uh, simply higher, uh, or I should say simply lower minimum requirements. So, so developers would have the flexibility to build less parking uh, if they chose. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that could actually be formulated. And the way this plays out, you, I just read an article about the way that played out in Seattle. And they um, they did it within, I think, a half mile of high capacity transit is where they just, they they flipped it. But Portland, Oregon was notoriously the first city to get rid of their parking minimums. So there's no minimum parking. They didn't have a zero park development for like 10 years. So I heard it, it's on the chat, you know, it's at a, no, no one will ever finance something if there's not enough parking. Well, you leave that to the professional developers sort of discretion associated with that instead of some arbitrary coefficient set by the Institute of Transportation Engineers based upon a development that they saw 30 years ago. Right. So it becomes much more specific to your town and um, and hopefully it'll give you a better out out uh, better output. And it's what they're seeing in other parts of the other parts of the country, for sure. And there's a lot in the chat about parking. There's also more in the chat, like Vicky's comment about um, spending public money by need being important and changing the way we do PIAC. So we don't just um, divide money equally up by district. Again, priorities are really important. Coordinating with public works, including the water department, and water services is also important when you're thinking about construction efforts and that's from Marcus. Also talking about um, when you're doing that coordination, plan for alternate access when service is disrupted. More in the chat about parking again, but tying it to new housing. I guess people are gonna park on the street probably. If you got parking changes, you park in the neighborhood. Okay, there are nine of you that have voted, but I think there's more in here that can vote. Please do so. We're at a sort of a dead heat. Yes, no, maybe <laughs> on how you think that we have, if we're on the right track. <laughs> And I know parking is always a, a spirited discussion, and I see we have a spirited discussion in the chat, and I would like uh, to remind you all to uh, make sure we're uh, remaining objective or remaining civil, and we're not uh, talking about other uh, meeting attendees in particular, but just providing your input for our feedback uh, into the plan process. Mm -hmm. It's typically, uh, you're not supposed to bring up parking in polite conversation, but um, we're hoping everyone can remain civil. Got some comments about bankers in the chat. Okay, so yeah. we, go ahead. Bye. Oh, just the idea. Sorry, I think my my comment might have been misconstrued. Not that I know more about parking than you know development professionals, but you know, sort of letting giving them the discretion. Okay, keep I guess mull it over some more if you're unsure about voting. You can also do an unsure if you're unsure, but definitely. If you're not in that bucket, do yes, no, or maybe. We're gonna and go to you, the- Oh, sorry, if you need the time to process this stuff, mm -hmm. it's it's gonna be on the Playbook website as well. So if you need it to sort of uh, marinate a little bit before you um, wanna, or you or something comes up in a flash of brilliance, um, you'll be able to comment on the website. Mm -hmm. Definitely can comment after the meeting. If you are thinking that we're missing something, and I feel like there's probably some people that think we're missing something, something needs clarity, um, I know that there's comments in the chat about prioritization for funding and also improvements of what that process is, et cetera. Please indicate that in your comments. But the key thing is with our recommendations, what is missing? And for those who are in Mentimeter and you're wanting to comment like that, the address is in the chat. It's the link in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you just want to share your thoughts out loud, and then we'll record those and pop them in the chat. Marcus has ensure true. 
and efficacious public engagement on the performance indicators and other elements that establish the guides, excuse me, that establish the guides the plan will suggest. And that's in the chat, copied into the Mentimeter. Also, there's something else on Mentimeter about the engagement. If it needs to wait until people can do this in person, then wait. We have a handful of people. That is right, we don't have very many people here. So one of the good things is that we do have, and maybe Jeff can talk about this more, or Bo can talk about this more. We've been doing some on the ground engagement, asking some general questions. We have, I think we've finished with on the ground engagement. By that, I mean non-virtual engagement for mobility. But Bo, can you speak to that a bit about what the engagement yeah, is so doing? Yeah, so this is certainly not the end of our engagement, uh, this meeting. In fact, we'll take this meeting and put it online. All of these, all, all of this information and these polls will be available for people to vote on. This meeting will be available for them to, to view as well. So we're hopeful that people will continue uh, this meeting virtually, you know, on our website as well. Um, we're also um, uh, on, we are actually on the ground, you know, our, 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 our public engagement consultants uh, are out at community events and whatnot, um, disseminating uh, paper surveys uh, to people. And, and uh, right now, they've done, uh, they're doing livability and serviceability, which we'll, we'll start next month uh, having strategy sessions on, but they had uh, previously done paper surveys on mobility as well. Um, so, so we're not just virtual, we're out, we're out in there. And then I think they got, you know, over a thousand paper surveys uh, through that process during the mobility process as well. So and um, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Mr. Williams, but we've also, you know, reviewed the recommendations and engagement associated with area plans um, since the area planning process began and include and also recommendations and engagement associated with focus. Um, and these are enduring themes. So this isn't um, just things that happened very recently. These are what what. What we're rec what we're recommending is coming out of it really enduring themes associated with transportation and mobility in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I might add a, an additional comment just about engagement and, and where we're at. And I, I think people who participated um, on on these calls on all of them um, and these sessions, thank you for that. Um, I just noted through um, each time we do this, we get more and more chat. And I think that relates to we're getting more and more specific about recommendations being made. Um, and I think that having more specifics um, and of uh, being um, clear about what recommendations could be in the plan, I think that elicits more comments. I know that as we do these sessions, our hope is to do things in person. I think when we get to plans to have the plan in a more um, set form, I will be moving forward. And I think that we will have engagement, one-on-one -on -one in person engagement up until um, the plan is adopted by the city council. So, so know that, know that we're we appreciate you contributing in this way. Point made, we're taking a look at, at past feedback opportunities, what we're learning now, what we're hearing now through virtual, and know that that's how we're working to put recommendations together. But as those recommendations get more fleshed out and as we move into a new year and hopefully a new year with with less restrictions on on people meeting one-on-one, -on -one, that's where we want to be at. So um, appreciate doing this. Um, is th there's never enough public engagement and there's never too many um, opportunities to be able to engage with folks. So uh, appreciate what you're doing. Definitely appreciate the feedback. Hey, I would like to see, be able to do more things in person. We want to get ourselves to, to that place and, and know that you know we will be taking feedback um, and recommendations and looking at crafting things right up until the adoption of our new comprehensive plan for the city. And with that, we have, I think, one minute left in this meeting time. How about if we go to this slide, what the next steps are, Bobby? We got a bunch, I'm, I'm dying to go back through the chat and mine that for, um, refinements to this set of recommendations. Um, the, the, the things that I, I just glimpsed a bunch of stuff that's really great. So excited about um, being able to refine these. And then um, 
we have more concepts that we're going to be rolling out in the, and i think in the we're going to take january just because it's so packed we're starting um the livability and serviceability strategy sessions so we don't want to crowd those out so we're going to run this meeting back in, in february which will give us a little even more time to be able to um, continue with our online engagement efforts and um, make sure that our our other recommendations are um, more ready for prime time. So look for that in um, in February. And then and also um, keep your eye on the website as well for um, other ways to be able to read recommendations and and comment and. You know, I know there's a bunch of people. This is the fifth meeting. I just wanted to repeat again what Mr. Williams said. Thanks for those of you who stuck with us and for the folks who are here today. We really appreciate um, we appreciate your participation and tell your friends to come do the thing online. So thank you very much. Really appreciate y'all.